Okay, well, I am very thankful to be able to bring sort of like the second portion of the talk that I started last week, and I noticed that there are a few new people today. I will try not to repeat too much stuff, but I do want to make sure that we understand the different concepts that we looked at last week, and then we'll put them all together and we'll have a go at it. So my talk um, is actually a very important subject. It's quite difficult to talk about, but I do believe that it is a critical discussion for the church today. Just a reminder, if you're interested in things from CMI, to go to the website, which is creation.com. So let's dig into this, and we'll see how far we get today. Now, how would you feel if your six-year-old daughter came home from school one day and very sadly told you, Mommy, my teacher told me today in school that this ugly rat was my great-great-great-great-great-grandpa, and now we're all just part of the monkey family. That would be very devastating to a six-year-old child. Or what about when your 14-year-old son comes home from the Friday night youth meeting and he says to you, you know, Dad, we were talking about a bunch of stuff at youth. And then the youth pastor jumped in. He said, get serious, Josh. Genesis 11 isn't history. It's just an allegory. Now, I know that the youth in this church is safe, but do you know what's being taught in other youth groups today? Or what about your granddaughter She comes home after her first year of Bible school and she says there were no such people as Adam and Eve. No one believes that anymore. These scenarios are being played out every single day in some of our Christian schools, Christian universities, and in seminaries. And the root of this teaching is called theistic evolution. And it has now infiltrated into our churches, into the Bible schools, and even into homeschool curriculum. Little children, youth, and young adults are the target audience of this new belief system. Let me tell you about an organization called BioLogos. They are the leading organization of theistic evolution, and they are now supported by multi-million dollar financial grants. Back in 2007, Dr. Francis Collins founded BioLogos, and he said that their mission is to promote harmony between science and biblical faith as we present an evolutionary understanding of God's creation. So I want you to note specifically, what is he trying to harmonize or bring together? They're organized as trying to weave together evolution and creation, but these are two completely opposite faiths. But there's more. On their website, Dr. Collins says this is what they believe. Number one, we believe the Bible is the inspired and authoritative Word of God. Well, that sounds good so far, but you have to be careful. You have to read their entire statement of faith to see what they actually believe. By statement number eight, they say that they believe God created all of life over billions of years. And then by statement nine, they believe that the origins of all life on earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution with common descent. I would graciously like to ask, where is the God-ordained process of evolution found in the inspired and authoritative Word of God? But there's actually much more. 2010, Dr. Kenton Sparks, professor of biblical studies at Eastern University and BioLogos author, posted on the BioLogos website, He said, if Jesus as a finite being erred from time to time, there's no reason at all to suppose that Moses, Paul, and John wrote Scripture without error. Rather, we are wise to assume that the biblical authors expressed themselves as human beings writing from the perspectives of their own broken horizons. Are you concerned when you read that Jesus erred, which means he made mistakes? This is known as the kenosis heresy, as opposed to the hypostatic union, which we believe that God was 100% fully God and 100% fully man. Or that the biblical authors expressed themselves as human beings, which means that they wrote Scripture without the God-breathed inspiration. Now, when I read this, I was very disappointed. How can a professor of biblical studies make such a statement, and where is their trust in Scripture? John 12 says, 
Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who, who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And of course in 2 Timothy, that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And so from this somewhat difficult introduction, the critical question now arises. Is it possible to believe in the inerrant Word of God and the theory of evolution at the same time? Are these two compatible with each other? So in about the next 40 minutes, we're going to examine the evidence and address this question. And so the title of my talk this morning is Christianity at a Crossroads, a critical analysis of theistic evolution. Let's begin by asking this question. Will believing in theistic evolution lead our children and our young people towards believing in the inerrancy of the Bible, or will it lead them away from the Bible? And as we discuss this topic and as a basic framework, let's put forth these three main ideas to consider today. How does theistic evolution affect the message of the gospel? What are the possible consequences of theistic evolution? And should we be teaching evolution and theistic evolution to our children? In order to be perfectly clear, I want to provide what I'm going to call a quick summation of the fundamental pillars of both creation and evolution so we can actually see what are we comparing here. So creation is founded on God's truth as written in the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit, and stands authoritative in its original forms of Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. In Genesis 21, it clearly states that there was a literal six-day creation, and on the seventh day, God said that the whole creation was very good. And Genesis 1 also states that God created all kinds of organisms, including everything from bacteria, protists, fungus, plants, and all the different animals. And it also says that man was created by God and in his image on day six of the creation from the dust of the earth, and God breathed into man's nostrils that breath of life, and then man became a living soul. According to the carefully recorded genealogies in the Bible, the earth is about 6,000 years old, and there was a global flood about four and a half thousand years ago with overwhelming evidences found in geology, in paleontology, that is the study of the fossils, and in ancient history. Even in the symbolic Chinese language, which dates back more than 2,000 years, for example, the word large ship is depicted by these three symbols, an eight-person boat. I find that very interesting. No one is wife and the th- there it is, eight-person boat. Now, let's have a look at evolution. Evolution is a theory or belief system whereby, given enough time, an organism can change and evolve into a new species. But of course, there's much more, and we looked at this quite extensively last week, where evolution started out with nothing, And then there was this cosmic Big Bang. And then somehow life spontaneously arose from non-life over billions of years. And then somehow this life mutated over these billions of years to become all life forms. And this is what's being taught today in our school systems as being a fact. Now, here is man in this chart. And here is what they call the common ancestor. What I find interesting is that is a protist. It's not even a bacteria, so they can't even get their biology correct. And this is where that rat-like creature fits into the evolutionary family tree. Now, more importantly, evolution is supposed to work without any divine interventions. And this is called naturalism. So in other words, nature can account for everything. And most important, That means that no God is required. Now, when most people think about evolution, they think it is apes becoming human beings. And we discussed this quite extensively last week, that it was evolution is on how microbes become a man. So the microbe has to become the rat, who then has to become the ape, who then has to become the man. That is evolution. 
What then is theistic evolution? Well, according to Dr. Collins, evolution is real, but that it was set in motion by God. What's the interpretation? Well, God made the universe, but man came via the animal kingdom. And this is the important part. He was not made in the image of God, nor did he come directly from the dust of the ground. And this is a clear violation of the Scripture. Now, theistic evolution also attempts to add all of the mechanisms of evolution to the Bible and to add billions of years to the Bible, but it takes away any literal interpretation of Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Now, according to Biologos, they say that Genesis is nothing more than a metaphor. In other words, it is not to be taken literal. We all know that there is clear warnings in the Bible about tampering with Scripture, and this includes the book of Revelation and the other books of the Bible. Let's read this. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them and if anyone takes away from them, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city. Every word of God is tested. Do not add to his words or he will prove you, and you will be proved a liar. So in a nutshell, theistic evolutionists believe in uniting the two opposing beliefs of a creator God and then the non-God requirements of evolution. So no God was required to make bacteria, and certainly no God was required to make all of these incredibly different animals. Folks, is this not an insult to the all-powerful Creator God if He didn't actually do this? Dr. Henry Morris, in his book, The Long War Against God, the idea that a loving, wise, and powerful God used evolution with its struggle for existence as His method of creation is grotesque. Evolution is the cruelest, most wasteful, and most irrational method of creation that could ever be imagined, not even to mention the fact that it is scientifically untenable. Spurgeon, is there a fish in the sea or fowl in the air which was left to chance for its formation? Nay, in every bone, joint, and muscle, sinew, gland, and blood vessel, you mark the presence of God working everything according to the design of infinite wisdom. So, In reality, theistic evolution is a contradiction of two very opposing faiths. What does this look like? Well, theistic evolution attempts to combine the word of God of Christianity with the word of man of evolution, but these are contradictions of faith. Why? Because they're heading in completely opposite directions. Christianity is purposeful in that our purpose is to bring honor and glory to God. The purpose of evolution, however, is to prove that no God is required. Believing in evolution is going to draw us away from God, not towards Him. This is what Dawkins says, which is interesting. I think the evangelicals have got it right in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. Theistic evolution is a superfluous attempt to smuggle God in by the back door. I want you to think of theistic evolution this way. Let's represent God as being a horse and evolution as being a tractor. And theistic evolution wants God to pull the tractor along. Is adding God to pull the tractor just an effort to appease their conscience? Why? Because evolution has to be an unguided and undirected process. And so now we come to what I call a theological continuum. How do all of these different origin theologies compare to one another? I did teach this in the adult Sunday school class. I want to go through it again with you folks this morning. I arbitrarily chose on the left-hand side to represent theism, on the right-hand side, uh, sorry, atheism, and on the right-hand side, theism. And I've chosen this little blue mark here that everything to the left of this, no God is required. Everything on the right, 
God is required. Now on the left-hand side, we have folks like Charles Darwin, Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, and so forth. We want to focus on the right-hand side this morning. On the very far right-hand side, we have the literal, biblical, six-day creation as recorded in Scripture that God created everything in those six days and that He rested on the seventh day. Beside them is the long-age theory proposed by men like Dr. Hugh Ross and his organization, Reasons to Believe. Now, these folks believe that, in, that God is the Creator, but that He used millions and billions of years to do it. Now, since there's about a million different types of animals, Dr. Ross teaches that once a year God stepped into the creation and would make one type of a creature, then he would step out of the creation, the next year he would step in. He did this in and out business for one million years until all of the creatures were created. Beside that would be the gap theorists. We talked about this last week where they suppose that there are two separate creations. God made the first creation, and that's where the dinosaurs fit in, and that's called the age of the dinosaurs. And no, I don't want that. So then he wiped that out, and then he made a second creation. But last week we looked at the fact that this does not be supported by Scripture, and of course it clearly violates that there's death, disease, and suffering before original sin. The one that we want to look at this morning is this one right here, theistic evolution. And I want you to note on how close theistic evolution gets to the line where no God is required. Let's take a few minutes now and let's look at six reasons why the incorporation of evolutionary mechanisms with a Creator God and the Bible do not work. Number one, we looked at this one last week, where microbes become man. And we said that this whole process is genetically impossible because of the following. In order for a microbe to become a man, you have to gain genetic information. We found out last week that the microbe has about 100 pages of genetic information, but a human being has a thousand encyclopedias worth of genetic information. And of course, this is impossible because mutations result in a loss of meaningful genetic information not again. Again, what does the Scripture say? God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Number two, theistic evolution puts death, disease, and suffering before Adam and original sin. And we looked at these two verses. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered in the world and death through sin... So death spread to all men because all have sinned. For the wages of sin is death. Now here's the critical consequence I'd like you to see. If death is not the penalty for sin, then Christianity is meaningless. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Sin is what separated man from God in the first place. And otherwise, the reality of heaven and hell are also meaningless if death is not the penalty for sin. Number three, evolution and theistic evolution are not supported by the Scripture or by the fossil record. So let's first look at Scripture. If the evolutionary processes and millions of years are true, then why doesn't the Bible describe it even in the simplest terms? Nowhere in Scripture does it say that after 10,000 times 10,000 years, this creature slowly turned into this creature. What we do find in Scripture, however, is statements like this. Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and there was evening and morning a fifth day. So there are your created creatures, and there is your definitive time period. Theistic evolution is also not supported by the fossil record. In order to go from this rat-like creature up to the ape-like creature, there should be millions of transitional fossils found in the fossil record of the billions of fossils that have been found today. 
there's only a handful of very disputed examples, but certainly not the millions of them, to go from one creature to a million different organisms. Theistic evolution is absolutely not supported by the fossil record. But we do read in Scripture that God made the beasts of the earth after their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And last week we looked at the creation orchard, the God's created kinds, the dog kind, the monkey kind, the bird kind, and it was through this genetic variation, not evolution, that we have all the different types of animals that we see today. And notice that there was no jumping between kinds. Dogs do not become monkeys, and last week we discovered that dinosaurs don't become chickens, if you remember that particular slide. Evolution is degrading to humanity. Now, this one is very hurtful and actually difficult to talk about, and I apologize for what you're going to see, but you need to hear this kind of stuff. Creationist and well-known pastor, Dr. John MacArthur, in his book, The Battle for the Beginning, he states, If evolution is true, humans are just one of many species that evolved from common ancestors. We are no better than animals, and we ought not to think that we are. What does this look like? I'd like to introduce you to Ingrid Newkirk. She is the founder and president of PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and very much an evolutionist. This is what she said. There is no rational basis for saying that a human being has any special rights. A rat is a pig is a dog is a boy. That is terrible. A boy is created in God's image, and they are neither rats, pigs, or dogs. And this just lowers humans to the animal level. But this is the worst one. Six million Jews died in concentration camps, but six billion broiler chickens will die in slaughterhouses this year. Evolution and theistic evolution are degrading to humanity if we are all just higher evolved animals. This is an unbelievable statement. Again, what does the Scriptures teach us? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Number five, theistic evolution contradicts the lordship of Jesus Christ. So how can a theistic evolutionist call Jesus Lord and Savior but then have a complete disregard for the authority of Scripture and Jesus' own words. Here are two very important examples. We looked at the first one last week. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So Jesus is quoting directly here from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Now, theistic evolutionists believe the very beginning of creation was bacteria and man didn't come on the scene until billions of years later but certainly not at the beginning is it possible that jesus is not telling us the tr excuse me the truth here in mark chapter 10 jesus also spoke in matthew chapter 23 of adam and eve's son as being able as a real person from the blood of righteous abel to the blood of Zechariah. Why would Jesus use a fictitious person to make a very important point? Remember that theistic evolutionists do not believe in a historical Adam and Eve. And where then is their trust in the inspired and authoritative Word of God, as Dr. Collins said at the beginning there? And lastly, evolution is an amoral process, but man is a moral being created in the image of of God. Folks, this is an irreconcilable contradiction. Animals are amoral beings. There are no good goldfish or bad goldfish. They do not and cannot make moral decisions. But man, we are moral beings. And the mechanisms of evolution cannot explain where morality comes from. If you ask an evolution, where does morality come from? They're going to say, well, it evolved. No, that's not true. In evolution, morality is meaningless. MacArthur, 
By embracing evolution, modern society aims to do away with morality, responsibility, and guilt. Evolution suppresses our innate knowledge that there is a God and we are accountable to Him. Folks, no animal is going to stand in judgment before God someday. Only man is accountable and theistic evolution cannot explain where morality comes from if we are all just evolved from the animal kingdom. If there is no accountability, then there is no hope. Evolution has no hope. You live, you survive, you die. What does the Bible say? And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. What a beautiful promise. So it seems to me that the prerequisite for theistic evolution is to have a very low view of Scripture, especially when it mentions anything about the Genesis account. You can't have a high view of Scripture and then you have to do all these mental gymnastics with the Bible to force fit the millions of years and evolution into it. So let's analyze what we've discussed here. Is theistic evolution actually supported by the Bible? Yes or no? Let's go through the six statements. Did microbes become man? Is that supported by the Bible? No, absolutely not. Man was created in God's image. There was death, disease, and suffering before Adam. Absolutely not. Millions of years and transitional fossils. That is not supported by the Bible. The degradation of humanity. You shouldn't even have to think about that one. And a contradiction of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is that supported by the Bible? It's not. Evolution is an amoral process. Is that supported by the Bible? It's not. Do you see a pattern here? Theistic evolution is not supported at all by the Bible. And so we are now at a crossroads, that theological fork in the road. Do we want our children to be taught and believe in a literal, biblical six-day creation or theistic evolution? And are we doing enough to equip our youth to face the challenges that they will encounter when they go to college or university, whether that be secular or Christian? There are numerous Christian liberal arts universities and colleges all over the world. I've chosen just one out of many examples, and this is Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's one of the larger Christian universities in the United States, and the following are direct quotes from their website, and to their credit, they don't hide anything of what they're going to teach to your children. We accept the biological theory of evolution to be the best explanation for understanding the diversity and commonality seen among all living creatures on earth. We believe that the best way to learn about God is by integrating these two sources of truth, God and evolution, and we believe that God brings forth the creation through evolutionary means we affirm that life on earth has exi- or we affirm that life has existed on earth for billions of years if you send your children there this is what they're going to be taught so along with calvin college i've chosen four examples of people that you may recognize but you may not also know that they believe and teach and support a very theistic evolutionary worldview here we go Timothy Keller, best-selling author, number one, Biologos and or C. Philip Yancey, best-selling author, Biologos and or C. How about a little bit closer to home? Dr. Dennis Venema, professor of biology, Trinity Western University, Biologos author, blogger. Dr. Arnold Sikama, professor of physics, Chair of Mathematical Sciences, Trinity Western University. I know Dr. Sikama personally. He is a very nice man. But he is also the president of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, which is the Canadian version of theistic evolution and biologos. So, after we send our children to these and dozens of other church and religious institutions where they are taught theistic evolution as a fact, where will they end up? 
Will they be strengthened in their faith and believe in the inerrant Word of God right from the very first verse? Or will those seeds of doubt about a biblical creation already be deeply rooted into their heads? Well, in order to answer this question, I needed to find out something. What is at the end of the fork in the road? If you take theistic evolution to its logical consequences, where will you end up? Well, this is what I found. I found this man, Edwin Walhoot. He was a pastor for more than 40 years, a theologian and an author, and many, of, of many books and papers, and this is the one that we want to focus on this morning. This was his thesis, Tomorrow's Theology. Two critical statements. He said, The findings of modern science are reliable and must now be taken as established fact. A six-day creation does not comport with the reality that the universe is 15 billion years old. So that's a theistic evolutionary worldview. Where does he take this? If you take theistic evolution's logical conclusions, this is where you will end up. And I want you to note, these are direct quotes. I didn't make up any of this. Are you ready? The doctrine of Adam and Eve. Sustaining this doctrine is extremely difficult when we take seriously the human race shares ancestry with other primates such as chimpanzees. We have to find a better understanding what Genesis tells us about Adam and Eve. Number two, the doctrine of the fall into sin. If we take the discoveries of historical science seriously, where could we fit that story in? At what stage in human development did this event occur? And as a result, we have to find a much better way of understanding and defining what sin is, where it comes from, and what its true consequences are. Folks, the wages of sin is death. Period. The doctrine of original sin. If Adam and Eve are not understood as real historical people then there can hardly be an inheritance of sinfulness passed from parent to child, in which case the entire doctrine of original sin falls by the wayside. Here we go. The doctrine of salvation. The works of Jesus deal with two aspects of original sin, guilt and pollution. And if you read enough theistic evolution material, they focus on guilt and pollution often. They say that Jesus removes our guilt by dying for us on the cross and He removes our pollution by sending us His Holy Spirit. This makes good sense and theologians need to consider whether our understanding of Jesus also needs to be revised. Thus, how does the theory of evolution have implications for how we understand Jesus' ministry, His death, His resurrection, and His ascension? How are you doing so far? I'm sick to my stomach when I read this. Well, one more. God's purpose in history. Evolution is a way of understanding history. What then is God's purpose in all of this? Can we see anything in God's purpose for time in history? And can we get a glimpse of what the world will look like in billions of years from now? Major changes may well be in store for end time doctrines. Eschatology. We need to take seriously in our Christian theology the theory of evolution which has now developed into established fact. Folks, this teaching is going on right now to your children and most people don't even know it or see what is happening. And I graciously want to ask you this question. Is this the theology that we want taught to our children? I don't. Organizations like BioLogos have extensive resources that promote theistic evolutionary teaching starting at the pre-elementary level and goes all the way up to pastors in seminaries. They also have material for teaching evolution for youth leaders, small group studies, and campus ministries, and most of this stuff is being disguised as creation material. Did you catch this? This week in creation. Folks, they are mocking God and His Word here. Why then are so many people believing and teaching today theistic evolution? MacArthur, 
Theistic evolutionists try to marry the humanistic theories of modern science with biblical theism because they claim they love God. But the truth is they love God little and their academic reputations a lot. How did this ever happen? Well, people are looking to the wrong source and then they attempt to justify this very unbiblical position. You see, the postmodernism of the world has now crept into the church. What is postmodernism? Well, in simplest terms, there are no absolutes and truth is what you make it. So let's try a little example. I'm going to give you a little assignment here. I want to show you a statement and you have to now identify the postmodernistic teacher teaching, sorry. I've chosen a few pages out of this children's book. It's written by a grandma and the target audience is 4 to 6 year olds, okay? See if you can pick it out. Page 1. Look Nana, this science book says it took billions of years for our earth to form. I thought the Bible said it took 6 days. Which is right? Nana, help! Page 2. Nana has some ideas about this. Not everyone agrees with Nana. That's okay. Even Nana's ideas are changing as she learns more and more. Please keep on being curious and honest to find ideas that you can believe for yourself. So where is the postmodernistic ideology in this little tiny children's book? Well, there's the setup. Not everyone agrees with Nana, and that's okay. But here it is. Please keep on being curious and honest to find ideas that you can believe for yourself. Postmodernism is being taught to a four-year-old. And this book can be found on the BioLogos website. A few pages later, Grandma decides to explain the origins, and this is what she writes. Most scientists are saying it took billions of years to form the earth. If that's true, then six days is impossible, so the Bible must be wrong. This grandma is not only telling children that they can determine what they think is true, but now she's also planting those seeds of doubt in their minds that the Bible must be wrong, and this kind of material is popping up everywhere. So, what are the roots then of theistic evolution? We've been looking at the fruit, the manifestation. What are the roots? What are the underlying things? There are three. They have the wrong view of God. They have absolutely the wrong inflated view of man. And they absolutely have the wrong view of Scripture. So now we come to the hardest question. Should we be teaching evolution and theistic evolution to our children? You know what I say? Absolutely. Absolutely we need to educate every aspect of these ideas so that they can soundly refute them with solid biblical teaching and scientific evidences. Our children and our youth should absolutely be equipped so that they can be well grounded in their faith and then they can recognize any form of deceitful teaching and then they can stand against this false doctrine that will take a tremendous amount of time and effort and energy on your part and my part. You know that Satan still uses the same old lie that he used from the very beginning. Did God really say? I want to propose to you two very critical questions. Is this important and does this matter for eternity? Because one never just falls off a cliff into unbelief. It's a gradual process of incremental steps. Let's finish off our time this morning by reading some very powerful words from Scripture. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. They deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrance contrary to the teaching which you learned. And that teaching would be in the Old Testament and it gives the creation account. And turn away from them. 
For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. I believe that we need to stand on this truth and this exhortation. Your faith should not rest on the wisdom of God, but on the power of men. No, it says you're on the wisdom of men, but put your but on the power of God. I blew that, but that's okay. At least you caught that. You're, you're paying attention. All right. I think that this is a very important thing that we need to understand. And so I want to invite you to do your own research on theistic evolution and biologos. Go to the creation.com website and just type into the search engine theistic evolution or biologos and see all of the different articles. Remember also to pray for discernment because deceit is not always obvious. And that's why it's called deceit. And remember that we always have to compare everything you read to the Word of God. And so, how can we do this as a Christian community? I challenged you last week. I'm going to do that again. Are you ready with answers for your children? Because if you're not, when your children go to these types of schools and Christian universities and colleges and seminaries, they are going to be delighted to give them answers that I don't think that we will agree with. I would like to just help you with some of the resources. This is one of them today, Evolution and the Christian Faith, an honest look at theistic evolution in the light of Scripture. And I think we might actually be sold out of that one this morning. If you would like that, James can take your name on a card and I will get a new order of all of these books brought in. This one I do know we have. A question of origins created or evolved. What are the effects of a belief in evolution? I think this is one of the very best books that's been written within the last five years. It handles everything at the grade 10, 11, and 12 level of science. It answers these very important questions. DNA battles in this DVD here from seven scientists and two theologians refute theistic evolution from genetic evidences. And I want to share with you once more a page from the feedback page of the Creation magazine that I think is very important. I'm so grateful that my children have had the life-saving benefit of being exposed to your magazine for years. Raising and working around teenagers, I see they struggle because they are indoctrinated from day one with real scientists don't believe in the Bible. Now here it is. If their parents don't support them, usually they will have no support because our kids are not going to buy these resources. I would like to end this morning on a very simple word of exhortation. I thank you that I was able to share this message this morning and I would encourage us that we need to stand shoulder to shoulder in this church as we stand for biblical truth. Amen? Amen.